Good afternoon. Today we transmit uh, the report of the work of three committees, the Intelligence Committee, the Oversight Committee, as well as the Foreign Affairs Committee, into the President's misconduct with respect to Ukraine. Uh, and at the outset, uh, I want to just thank the incredible members of all three committees, uh, as well as our amazing staff uh, that did uh, um, long hours of work uh, through depositions, open hearings, uh, and compiling all of the evidence uh, into today's report. It was an enormous task, uh, and I want to begin uh, by acknowledging uh, the great work of the great uh, and late uh, colleague of mine, Elijah Cummings. Uh, we continue to be inspired uh, by his legacy um, and guided by uh, thoughts of his integrity and uh, the great moral clarity that he always showed in his work. I also want to thank uh, my colleagues, the Chairman Engel, Chairwoman uh, Woman Maloney, uh, for their uh, tremendous work as well. This report chronicles a scheme by the President of the United States to coerce an ally, uh, Ukraine, uh, that is at war with an adversary, Russia, uh, into doing the, the President's uh, political uh, dirty work. Uh, it involves a scheme in which Donald Trump withheld official acts, a White House meeting, as well as hundreds of millions of dollars of needed military assistance in order to compel that power to deliver two investigations that he believed would assist his re-election campaign. Uh, and I want to underscore, first of all, just how important that White House meeting was to Ukraine. Ukraine has a new reformer as its president, uh, President Zelensky. A meeting with the most important patron of Ukraine, the President of the United States, in the Oval Office carries enormous significance, uh, both to the people of Ukraine, but as equally important to Russia, that the United States has Ukraine's back in its conflict with a nation which invaded its territory. The military assistance is also absolutely essential. Uh, as President Zelensky goes into negotiations with Vladimir Putin, the fact that the United States is providing substantial military assistance approved on a bipartisan basis by Congress is enormously important. The withholding of that aid, even for a period of time, sends a disastrous message to friend and foe alike that the United States does not have the back of its ally. So these were things that Ukraine desperately wanted and needed. At the same time, there was something President Trump desperately wanted and believed that he needed, and that was an investigation that would damage the rival that he feared apparently the most, Joe Biden, as well as an investigation into a debunked <laughs> conspiracy theory that it was Ukraine, not Russia, that interfered in our last election. Now, that conspiracy theory, um, which is often summarized or characterized by the term crowd strike, that conspiracy theory is a Russian narrative. That is a conspiracy theory put out, promulgated by Vladimir Putin to deflect attention away from Russia's interference in our own election and to try to drive a wedge between the United States and the nation of Ukraine. So that's what the president wanted, these two sham investigations, one into uh, Joe Biden, uh, also debunked and discredited, uh, that, that sham investigative theory, but also into this idea that Ukraine interfered in our election, not Russia. And he was willing to sacrifice the national security of the United States by withholding military aid and diplomatic recognition in the form of that White House meeting in order to get what he wanted. That scheme, however, was discover, uh, because, among other things, a courageous person stepped forward and blew the whistle, but also because Congress announced that it would investigate the matter. Once we began our investigation and once it became clear to the President and to the White House that this was going to become public, this scheme was going to become public, only then did the President of the United States release the military aid. And as for that White House meeting that Ukraine so desperately sought, that has still not happened to this day. Now, what does this mean for Americans? Why should they care about what the president did vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? Why should they care indeed about Ukraine? First of all, 
This is not about Ukraine. This is about our democracy. This is about our national security. This is about whether the American people have a right to expect that the President of the United States is going to act in their interests with their security in mind and not for some illicit personal or political reason. So Americans should care deeply about whether the President of the United States is betraying their trust in him, betraying that oath that he took to the Constitution to protect our country and defend its institutions. So we should care about this. We must care about this. And if we don't care about this, we can darn well be sure the President will be back at it doing this all over again. Because, indeed, he already has. First, there was the invitation to Russia to interfere in our last election. Hey, Russia, if you're listening, hack Hillary's emails, and indeed later that day they tried to do exactly that. But then there was the use of this official power to compel another country, Ukraine, to interfere in the 2020 election. And even after, even after our investigation began, even after the impeachment inquiry began, there was President Donald Trump out on the White House lawn, once again making it abundantly clear that he wanted Ukraine to investigate the Bidens. Uh, and what's more, he wanted other countries to interfere in our election as well, and that China should also investigate the Bidens. This is the result of a president who believes that he is beyond indictment, beyond impeachment, beyond any form of accountability, and indeed above the law. And that is a very dangerous thing for this country to have an unethical president who believes they are above the law. The question now is, what does Congress do about this? One of the other very important uh, elements of our report today, which goes beyond the president's misconduct with Ukraine, goes to the president's obstruction of the Congress, of a co-equal branch of government. And I want to underscore also the seriousness of this misconduct, because the President informed every department for which we sought records, the State Department, the Office of Management Budget, which has the records about the withholding of the aid, the Defense Department, his own White House personnel, to refuse to turn over a single document in answer to congressional subpoenas. The President instructed witnesses not to appear. The President used his office and his bully pulpit to try to intimidate witnesses. If the Congress allows a president to so fully and um, blanketly obstruct the work of Congress, even involving an impeachment investigation into the president's own misconduct, <coughs> then we are begging for more of the same. We are signaling to any future president they can engage in whatever corruption, malfeasance, or negligence, and they are beyond accountability. And to my GOP colleagues, they need to consider that when we have a Democratic president, are they willing to say, in answer to their oversight, that a president may simply refuse? Because if they are, and if we do, it will mean that the balance of power between our branches of government will be fundamentally altered and altered for the worse. It will mean that future corruption, malfeasance, and incompetence will be far more likely than it is today. The facts here are really not seriously contested. Uh, indeed, the testimony of the witnesses was remarkably consistent. And you might be forgiven having watched the hearings and watched the reaction of the members of the two parties to the testimony of these witnesses if you thought that there were two different hearings going on at the same time. This points out another danger that the Founding Fathers we're all too aware of, and that is the danger of except, ex excessive factionalism. Uh, that is that a political party may become so wedded to a president of their own party that they're unwilling to do their constitutional duty. Uh, but I firmly believe that if one party relinquishes its responsibility to the Constitution and to their oath, it does not relieve us of our obligation to the same. Um, and I hope that every member of the House and the Senate, uh, whether these proceedings go forward in the House or they don't, um, will keep in mind their duty is to the Constitution, not to the person of the President. Uh, that ought to be our guiding principle. 
finally, I think what's presented to us here is really uh, so aptly summed up in what the President's own Chief of Staff had to say when he informed the country that, yes, indeed, they had withheld military aid to get this political investigation. He told us to get over it, to get over it. That is what the President does. We should just get over it. This is essentially what he was saying, that we need to just get used to the idea of a corrupt President and get over it. And so we will have to decide, given that the evidence of this misconduct is so clear and uncontested, are we prepared to just get over it? Are we prepared to say that henceforth we must expect from this President and those who follow that there will be a certain amount of corruption in which the national security of the country will be compromised, in which the oath of the office will mean that much less, uh, in which the belief in the rule of law in the United States will be that much less. Is that what we're simply to get over or get used to? Well, I, for one, don't think we should get over this. I don't think we should get used to this. I don't think that's what the founders of this country had in mind. Uh, indeed, I think that when they prescribed a remedy, this kind of conduct by a President of the United States putting his own personal political interests above the interest of the American people was exactly why they prescribed a remedy as extraordinary as the remedy of impeachment. Um, and so we have a very difficult decision ahead of us to make. Uh, and I have every confidence that the Judiciary Committee, in consultation uh, with the entire caucus and our leadership, um, will not only receive this report, as well as the reports of others, uh, and make a proper determination about whether articles of impeachment are warranted. With that, I'm happy to respond to your questions. When did you obtain the cell phone records that are in this report, and what did they tell you that you didn't learn otherwise from the witnesses you interviewed? Yeah. Well, I can't go into the specifics of, uh, you know, dates in which we obtained certain evidence uh, or, indeed, whether we obtained uh, communications from one or multiple parties. But certainly the phone records show that there was considerable coordination among the parties, including the White House. Coordination in the smear campaign against Ambassador Yovanovitch, which cleared the way for the three amigos to take over a significant part of Ukraine policy, uh, coordination in the execution of that policy, uh, and that, that this was indeed a continuum that began even prior to the recall of the ambassador. Uh, now, Garrett, your question gets to a, a very important point, which is there is more investigative work to be done. One of the issues that we are looking into is, did this scheme begin far earlier uh, than we first understood? Um, was this scheme, in fact, put in place to try to pressure the last president of Ukraine, Poroshenko, uh, and his corrupt uh, prosecutor general, Lutsenko, into conducting these same investigations? And was that plan uh, put into uh, turmoil and chaos when this new reformer, Zelensky, um, surged in the polling and ultimately won that presidency? Uh, that is something we continue to investigate. And that is something that these phone records also shed light on. Um, but even as we believe that we cannot wait because the President's efforts to secure intervention in the next election persist, um, we continue our investigation and, and we will. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, just, just to be clear, uh, it sure sounds like you support impeaching the President. Do you support impeaching and then the Senate removing him from office? I'm going to reserve uh, any kind of a, a public judgment on that uh, until I have a chance to consult with my colleagues, uh, with our leadership. Uh, and I think this really needs to be a, a decision uh, that we all make uh, as a body. Uh, so I'm going to continue to reserve judgment, but I, a, as you can tell, I am gravely concerned that if we merely accept this, that we invite not only further corruption, uh, of our elections by this president, but we also invited of the next president. Uh, so I am keenly aware of the significance of the precedent we set in whatever direction we move. And I'm also very strongly guided by the fact that 
One of the seminal moments in this scheme took place the day after Bob Mueller testified. The day after Donald Trump thought that the last investigation was over, he began the next significant step in a new course of misconduct. Yes. I mean, given that you said there's more investigating to be done, like, do, you were, do you feel like presenting the strongest possible case here to, that you're providing to the Judiciary Committee, or would the case be stronger if you had more time to do this extra investigation? Well, I, you know, I would say a couple of things. First of all, as I mentioned, you know, we continue to investigate whether this scheme began earlier than expected, whether this scheme also involved the last president of Ukraine. But look, we have provided overwhelming evidence in this report of a scheme to pressure the current president of Ukraine to conduct these political investigations. Um, will it move others if we're able to show that this was not the first time, this was the second time? Um, I think what we have produced uh, in, in remarkable short order uh, is so overwhelming that it ought to be presented to the Judiciary Committee now without any further delay. Um, if we do uncover additional evidence and, and we do learn more every day, we will feel free to file supplemental reports uh, to the Judiciary Committee. But there is, I think, grave risk to the country with waiting until we have every last fact, when we already know enough about the President's misconduct to make a responsible judgment about whether we think that's compatible with the Office of the President. Chairman, Chairman. Chairman. Yes. do the phone records cast doubt on anything you heard from the witnesses or anything the President has said publicly? No, they don't. Um, at least um, <laughs> that I can identify uh, at this moment. I think the, the phone records are remarkably consistent with the coordination of a lot of this scheme. Um, now, we obviously don't have complete phone records. And some of the phone records are deeply suggestive of who the parties were talking to, particularly in the White House or the Office of Management and Budget. But because of the President's effort to stonewall investigation, including not turn over their own phone records, not only to us but to witnesses like Sondland uh, who asked for them, um, we don't have all of the answers. But we do know this without any doubt, and that is the President of the United States solicited foreign interference in our election and used the power of his office, the power to convene a meeting in the Oval Office, the power to provide or withhold hundreds of millions of dollars of aid to an ally at war to get his political dirty work done. Um, the only question is how much more, how more extensive was the scheme, how many others may have been involved, what was the full knowledge and participation of other parties and while we intend to get the answers to those questions and let the American people know the full facts, we do not intend to delay when the integrity of the next election is still at risk. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yes. last question. Mr. Chairman, um, your report mentioned sites call records involving ranking member Nunes. Um, did you speak to him or inquire about those with his office, and do you believe he should recuse himself later today on this vote? Also, do you or your staff plan to present this report to the Judiciary Committee in person? The rules adopted by the Judiciary Committee provide that our staff counsel will present the report to the committee, so that's what we expect will take place. Uh, in terms of the ranking member, um, it won't surprise you, I'm going to reserve comment. Uh, it is, I think, deeply concerning that at a time when the President of the United States was using the power of his office to dig up dirt on a political rival, uh, that there may be evidence that there were members of Congress um, complicit in that activity. Uh, now, there's a lot more to learn about that, and I don't want to state that that is uh, an unequivocal fact. But the allegations are deeply concerning. Um, our focus is on the President's conduct first and foremost. Uh, it may be the role of others to evaluate the conduct of members of Congress. Chairman, Thank you very much.
Thank you.